No pain, no gain. <laughs> this popular slogan has been described as a modern American mini-narrative. This slogan and the recipe for development that it suggests is just wrong, destructively wrong. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to think for a moment and tell me, how long would you estimate the typical college freshman can read material in their book or in their notes and effectively be learning what they're reading? Okay? Okay? Five minutes, says Chris. 25 minutes? Hour? Hour? Now let me ask, anybody think more than an hour? How long? <laughs> anybody less than five minutes? Okay. So we get five to maybe four or five hours. A study was done, I believe the University of Michigan. They asked students to do the following thing. When you're ready to study... You've got all your materials. You're back in your little dorm room or your place you live. Check your watch. Start working. The moment you feel that sense of, I've read it, but it's not coming through, and it's like, eh, I'm wasting my time, and we all get that feeling, note what time it is. Record that. Bring it back. And they had many, many hundreds of freshmen and sophomores do this, and then somebody took the time to compile it. And typically right about 25 to 30 minutes. By the way, it's also true of lectures, and you've all proved it to yourself. You come into a lecture, you're really alert, check the clock at about 25 after, it's like, yeah, and I see it in every class I teach, but how long do we teach? 50 minutes. And yet, probably most of the learning, if it's gonna happen, is in the first 25 to 30. Telling people to study more does not necessarily help. In some cases, it might actually worsen their performance. What I want to do is show you graphically what I'm talking about. Let's say this is efficient studying, and I know there are no numbers there, but higher means more efficient, lower means low or no efficiency. And this axis, we're looking at time. Here's what happens for the average student. For her, 6 o'clock in the evening, after her supper at the residency dining hall, she plopped herself down at her little study area and started studying. But here's what happened. By about 6.30, she was in a major slump. But what was her goal? To study Six hours. So she continued to sit at her little desk and stare at pages. <laughs> until midnight. She was at her desk six hours. How long did she actually study? About 20, 30 minutes. Now, there's a simple conduct in psychology that all of you are aware of. Things that are reinforced, we tend to do more of. Things that are punished or ignored, we tend to do less of. You know, we operate by those principles to a large degree. If you're sitting there for six hours, are you feeling good? No. Over about two decades now, I and others have moved back and forth across these different kinds of laboratories and methods with the goal of answering three questions. One, what have athletes learned about the training process? Two, why does it work? And three, how can the rest of us use their hard-earned knowledge? To quantify endurance training, you have to accurately measure the two fundamental variables that combine to make up every endurance training workout. Intensity and duration. Duration is easy, but intensity is, is more challenging because we can measure intensity from two perspectives, external and internal. External intensity or workload is just the pace or power that we produce. 200 watts on a bicycle, for example. But that same external intensity
can produce very different internal workloads or uh, physiological responses in an athlete or when, when comparing across athletes depending on the physical capacity at the time. When we have endurance athletes of all ability levels come into the laboratory and exercise at increasing intensities and then measure these physiological responses such as oxygen consumption, ventilation, heart rate, and blood lactate, three distinguishable intensity zones emerge. And I'm going to call them green, yellow, and red. Pretty simple. Green, low intensity, low perceived exertion, relatively comfortable talking pace. Yellow, somewhat hard to hard, short response only, and kind of high perceived exertion. And then red, hard, high intensity, <gasps> one more minute, gasping pace. First rule, the moment you start to slide, you're shoveling against the tide. What you need to do is what? Take a break. And here's what's cool about it. You can study for a half hour. It doesn't take a half hour break to recharge your batteries. For most people, about five minutes. And this is where you go away, do something fun for five minutes. Call a friend, talk to a child, talk to a parent, a roommate. Enjoy some music. Do something you enjoy and actually say, this is my treat for having studied for 30 minutes effectively. Go back and here's what happens. Your efficiency is nearly 100%. Study a half hour, take a break. Study a half hour, study a half hour. Now had she done that over a course of six hours, she would have got about five and a half hours of serious studying and about a half hour of total break time. I really don't believe she would have flunked out. Now, I get students complaining, I don't have enough time to study. Look for a break at work. Look for a break at home. Those little 15, 20 minutes can be very efficient if you apply them efficiently. Unfortunately, sometimes it's really tough to get those moments. But you need to build them in somehow. You've got to have at least some time to study. It's not going to happen through osmosis. Now, I'm going to ask you a final question. Let's say you've studied till midnight, what do you want to do after your last study 20, 30 minutes? No, not yet. You want to give yourself a big treat, okay? Flow chart. This is such, this is pure genius. This guy is a pure genius. Basically, he went and he, uh, he coined the term flow. So like when you're in a state of flow, we've all been in a state of flow. The number one um, uh, way to know that you're in a state of flow is time fl flies by. When you're out of that flow state, cut it. We're going to get further. We're going to do more training if we cut it today and come back in tomorrow. Because I'm a big believer in consistency over intensity. Intensity should be done one in a, once in a while. Because by nature, intensity can only be done once in a while. If you're going hard every day, you're not really going hard every day. You can't go your max every day. There's a, there's a, there's a cost to going to your max. Can you sprint every single day? You cannot sprint every single day. It's ludicrous. You can sprint once or twice a week. The best sprinters in the world, they sprint once or twice a week. Nobody sprints every day. Because intensity, by nature, entails that you need to take a break. And we can ask the question, is no pain, no gain, the way the best athletes train? The answer is no, absolutely not. This is the basic intensity distribution that emerges from studying the best in the world across different sports, different countries, male and female, about eight out of every 10 of their training sessions, many training sessions, are performed in their green zone. The best athletes don't train very much in that medium intensity zone. Let's look at a few examples. This is Marit Bjorgen. She's the all-time Winter Olympian, male or female. Eight gold, four silver, and three bronze medals. She allowed sports scientists in Norway to digitize and analyze her entire training career and publish it. Here is her endurance training intensity distribution during her five most, most successful years of competition. Hundreds of hours spent in the green zone build the foundation for those red zone performances that were among the best in the history of the sport. Here's another example from Kenyan distance runners, 5,000 and 10,000 meter specialists. 85% of their training greens. I was jogging out on forest trails near my home and I saw a woman running in front of me. 
I recognized her because we had tested her in the laboratory, and I knew she was a well-trained endurance athlete, better trained than me. But what she did next surprised me. She came to the bottom of a short but steep hill, and instead of running up the hill, she started walking briskly. And then when she reached the top, she continued running again. Now, personally, I have never met a hill during training that I didn't at least try to run up, panting and straining all the way. No pain, no gain. So why did this woman, who was well-trained, choose to walk instead of run that day? And then, later, I was reading a newspaper article and an interview of the national team cross-country skiing coach at the time. He was the coach of true titans of endurance with Olympic gold medals and off-the-charts laboratory test results on their resume. But he said, we do not train at medium-hard intensity. It's too much pain for too little gain. Now, this was fundamentally opposed and different from what I had been taught to believe from laboratory studies. So I realized I was going to have to leave the comfort of the laboratory and study athletes in their laboratories, where out on the forest trails and skating ovals and hills and lakes, where they trained and tested themselves daily. How did the best endurance athletes actually train every day over weeks and months and years? You're sore. You overdid it. Whoa. Because I can't train the next day if I'm sore. Well, I, I open the wound. Every time I work out then. What's that? I said I've overdone it you every time have. I worked out. You may have. <laughs> you may have. You got to. There's a lot of people listening to this right now. Going, Wait a minute. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> Make your workouts a 7 out of 10 and do them every day. You're going to get far more training hours. You're going to spike your, you're going to spike your metabolism far more often. Mm -hmm. Your energy levels, your mood is going to be far more uh, uh, up. And, and training is going to be more addictive. The Eastern Bloc had a totally different understanding. They're like, it's volume, 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 near the fight, short and intense. Only near the, the competition phase. But before that, it's the maximum amount of volume you can... Imagine me and you are, are, are we're two athletes, A and B. You're A and B. You're training jiu-jitsu three times a week really, really hard. You're going all out. I'm training jiu-jitsu every single day. My average practice is two hours. Your average practice is two hours. But when you go in, you kill it. Like, you, you go... You go with all the black belts and you kill it. At the end of the year, I'm averaging three practices or two practices more than you. So I've had 100 practices more than you by the end of the year. 104 practices. Mm. Let's give two weeks for vacation. 100 practices more than you. 200 hours more than you I've been training. When we roll, your intensity that you put on the mat is going to be irrelevant. Why? Because I've also tasted that intensity periodically. It's not that much of a factor now. When you go super aggressive on me, when you attack me aggressively, I have felt that. I know how to deal with it. Plus, I have an extra 100 hours on you, 200 hours. So I'm going to mangle you. You know what I'm saying? Mm. The volume is far more important than the intensity. No pain, no gain is false. So we now have a good understanding of how the best endurance athletes train when they've got the time and resources to train as hard and as much as they can. They do not train in the yellow zone, in the red zone every day because they can't. They train a lot, yes, and sometimes they push themselves to levels of exertion and fatigue that most of us will never experience. But on most days, they train in the green zone at an intensity that is relatively comfortable for them that they can go for a long time and recover and repeat day after day, and that's what brings success. Years ago, I, I coined the term polarized training. Lots of low-intensity training sessions, some high-intensity training sessions, but not too much in the middle. It's like that female athlete that walked up that steep hill that day. It was an easy training day. The best endurance athletes train with discipline, intensity discipline. Easy days stay easy, and hard days, well, they're hard. So why does this polarized approach seem to work better than training harder more often and maybe less overall? Well, for the highest performance levels to be attainable over time, the process itself, the training process, has to be sustainable. Training produces very specific molecular signals for adaptation in all of these different kinds of cells that add up to improve performance. But that same training is also a source of stress on the system as a whole. And research has shown us that chronic, moderately high levels of stress, whether it's 
daily TED Talk stress or physical stress can lead to burnout, stagnation, and overtraining. You just can't turn on the fight or flight response every day in training. Athletes have learned that some low intensity days, some high intensity days, seems to give an optimal balance. There's a time and place for intensity. I'm not anti intensity. I think that there's a time and place. Like Angelo Dundee was probably arguably the greatest boxing trainer in history. He says, look, fighting is for fight night. In practice, it's only practice.